All right, welcome back. PM Jam, Garini, Eli. Time to talk a little NFL draft. It's never too early to start getting those juices flowing. That's right. Uh, joining us now, our old friend, draft expert and uh, good dude all around, Vach Lombardi. You can find his stuff on uh, YouTube, v- at Vach Lombardi on Twitter. Vach, what's up, man? How are you? Man, life is good. I can't complain. Too short on the theme music. About time somebody listens around here. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, thanks for having me back, man. We're going to have another year of uh, interesting draft talk. I'm not, I'm not going to take good draft talk because this class looks a little... Uh, but we got some but we got some interesting draft talk, to say the least. Uh, yeah, like you said, I mean, it, it does certainly lack some pop and sexiness, right? With, like, there's not a ton of, like... You know, super high-profile receivers and running backs. Although I think some of the running backs are really good, I'm surprised they're kind of buried so far down on a lot of these sort of Illuminati lists. But as you look at it, and I think there's a couple of guys that, and we'll get into it, that I I just don't understand why they're they are where they are. But in in your mind, um, obviously, there's a lot of defensive players, uh, some linemen in this thing. But where where do you see the strength the strength in this draft? Uh, look, man, it's kind of weird to say, but like. I would say these dudes that aren't going to be stars for you, but they could be pretty good complimentary guys for you. Like last year, right? There's never going to be. Hey, Ovash, who's the Michael Parsons of this year? Good luck to you. Who's the Jamar Chase of this year? Sorry to tell you. You know what I mean? And, you know, later on when we come back on the show, we're going to talk about these dudes that didn't play football and they just went to these COVID camps, went to these I'm not playing football camps, and they just learned how to be football players 365 days a year opposed to going to go play, like, Penn State or something yep. like that. I think there's 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 going to be something to that conversation moving forward. Uh, but you got some defensive ends that are going to be pretty good for you. Are they going to be superstars? Are they going to get double-digit sacks? I don't know. You got some pretty fun number two receiver type guys that are going to be good for you. Guys that you want to build a franchise around. I am not sure. But um, I'm an offensive line guy. And there's many, many offensive linemen this year. Uh, if you're looking for tackles, hey, you're a Jets fan. You know, you just drafted yeah. a tackle last year. You may be looking for another one. Um, there are plenty, uh, plenty tackles for you to find. But in normal league draft protocol or whatever, the best tackles normally go top 10, top 15, 17 if you're nasty. But once you get past that, it's like weird tackles that need work and like a gang of interior dudes. It's plenty guards this year, plenty centers this year. Are there a bunch of pro bowlers? I don't know. But it's some guys that you can build your team around for like five years. So that's what I think the theme of this draft is, you know, drafting these guys uh, that can come in and help you. If you draft well, you can really help your team. But I, I say this every year. Teams suck at drafting, so we really want to see how this works. Well, but you mentioned those offensive linemen, and I, one of the more polarizing guys, at least in my opinion, is Ekwanu from NC State. It seems like his stock has completely rose kind of out of nowhere over the last, you know, two or three weeks. The odds on him being drafted number one rose exponentially, and he's, you know, now in most top tens in mock drafts. You see, just, you know, what, what do you make of his rise here kind of d- during this time? Well, it shouldn't be polarizing at all because if you look at the top three guys in this draft, it's either you're going to go super heavy one side, super heavy to another side, or like right in the middle. Just like Mario Kart, right? There's the fast cars, there's the heavy cars, and there's the medium Mario dudes. <laughs> so if we look at IT and Apollo, right, he's all athleticism, all six, seven. 300 and mad pounds. He wants to just run into people and they explode, right? Pure natural talent. But he has no clue what offensive line is. Like there's this, there's this one clip that I show on my channel to where his feet are terrible. His hands are terrible. His hat placement is terrible. He's standing straight up. He's leaning forward, but he still blocks the dude because he's that good. He wants to push people out of the film. So then there's like Charles Cross from Mississippi State, who's the exact, who, he's not that, but he's like super technique dude, right? He's, I'm great with my feet, I'm great with my hands, I'm great with my passes. Uh, Mike Leach is my coach, so we don't run the ball too much, but he's not the physically talented, you know? And then there's Evan Neal, who's the, the, the middle of him. He's not super top tier one way, he's just really, really even. He's that Nick Saban coaching tree. Hey, man, we're well coached offensive lineman here, but he's not leaning towards any way. So what's going to happen is you're going, Going to run into these GMs, run into these coaches, and they're like, okay, we have no clue who the best number one guy is, so it's just going to be whatever we think we can fix. If you think that you can make Charles Cross a better athlete, make him more powerful or whatever, then run with that. 
I team, if you can teach him what to do with his hands and feet and how to rein that back a little bit to, you know, funnel that patience a little bit, if you can teach him that, then fine. What's going to end up happening is, just like two years ago with works and Wills and Beck and all these good guys going, but Andrew Thomas somehow goes first or whatever, I think that's going to happen with this. You're going to overthink something. You're going to go, well, I team can do this, but – he sucks at this. I don't want anybody that sucks at this. When what you should do is go, hey, that dude explodes people. Line them up, let them explode people, and just figure it out as we go. I said, how's this the Jets fan again? Makai Beckton was that same kind of dude, wasn't really good with his hands. But every time he touched somebody, they moved far, far away from the line of scrimmage. <laughs> just do the easy stuff that works and then work on the technical things later. But that's just me making sense. You know, everybody's not going to be there. Watch. What about on the other side of the of the line uh, with these two kids and Hutchinson and Thibodeau at the top? And you know, Hutchinson at least was productive uh, at a fairly high level uh, this year. Although you know, I think he might have been the best pass rusher in the Big Ten. But I don't know if that's you know, I don't know how great that really uh, makes him. And then Thibodeau's a guy that everyone's had as a you know blue chip number one type player in the draft for three years, and he's really not done anything. So. Uh, in your mind, are either one of these guys legit? Are they both Illuminati guys? How do you look at them? Let me say what I love about this show, man. And it's the only reason why I'm not too Hollywood to come back here is because you don't just follow the national word. You know what I mean? You at least watch the game yourself. You're at least going to look up a stat. You're at least going to figure things out on your own. I love that about it. Just clap it up for yourself <laughs> one good time. Uh, tip it off the fraud, man. Sorry, uh, Thibodeau's kind of working on, you know, that, that hype train thing. He was the number one player, you know, coming out of high school a couple of years ago. One, you know, one of the kids they've been, they've been, you know, looking at since he was 12 years old or whatever. He goes through the process. He smokes all these kids at his local high school and then he gets to college and he makes a few plays. It, if you look at a Kayvon Thibodeau highlight tape, sure, it'll look good to you, but I promise you, when you look at that highlight tape, you're going to see a lot of plays of, you know, nobody blocking him. You're going to see a lot of plays of, oh, he stumbled into this weird play. But if you watch film from top to bottom, root of the tutor, we don't just watch six to eight plays. We watch 68 plays. That dude will disappear. That dude will get blocked. That dude will look lost. And I look at Thibodeau, yeah, he's a very raw player. He has the, He could be great. You know, he could be a, a Derek Barnett type pass rusher, but he could be a Caleb Von Chason type guy. You know what I mean? One of those dudes that have the athletic traits, but he doesn't really figure it out, right? Hutchinson is, is the exact opposite of that, right? He's another one of these, I touch you, you blow up kind of guys. Um, if you watch, um, what's my man last year, uh, Michigan, Quiddy Payne, you watch him, you will just accidentally run into a lot of Aiden Hutchinson, right? And you'll go, hey, this Hutchinson dude would be good if he fixes X, Y, and Z. And he fixed those things, right? He became this great hand technique guy, this great run game player, physical strength. He has all this stuff. I think he'll be good playing some three tech on some passing down. I don't make player comparisons, but he does have a little bit of J.J. White, so I'm not because he's a big white guy, but he, but he kind of plays like him, right? <laughs> um, one thing I don't like about draft process is that sometimes teams use players how they're not going to be played. Whatever league team gets Aiden Hutchinson, his hand's going to be in the dirt. He's going to be very close to people. He's going to explode people. Michigan had him standing up playing linebacker, wide nine stuff, dropping them in coverage. That's nonsense, man. That's not going to happen. Um, to be fair, so far in my draft um, process or whatever, you haven't mentioned this dude, but there's a dude on the other side of Aiden Hutchinson, David Ajabu from Michigan. Yeah. I like him a little more than than um, Kayvon, what's his name, long name, tip it up, right? Because if you're watching Aiden Hutchinson, that same thing that we said just a few seconds ago, you watch another Aiden Hutchinson, you're going to keep going, hey, who's 55? Who's 55 jumping off tape like that? That's David Jabo. He's not great in the run game, but he's one of those dudes that's so good at pass rushing, you'll live with how not so good he is in the run game. You'll just try to fix it. I even like the kid from Purdue, George Karloftis. I like him a little more than Kayvon Thibodeau right now. So it sounds like I'm hating, but, you know, it is what it is. We have these kind of fights every single year, but uh, Thibodeau's a fraud until proven otherwise in court. Vach, taking a look at the receivers here, you kind of mentioned it that there's, you know, there's some guys that might not be a receiver one for you, but there could be some good guys here, you know, along the lines of Jamison Williams, Garrett Wilson. Just who who stands out to you the most from what you've seen so far? 
Um, the wide receiver class is kind of much so in that same way, but it's just really what you're looking for. I think uh, something that we do is, uh, or just something that we learn from, right, is we don't look at wide receivers and go, okay, what can't you do? Once upon a time in the league, they all wanted these six five guys that could run because Calvin Johnson was around, right? They want these six five guys that could run and catch. But those dudes don't really exist like that, so we got a chance to miss out on a lot of these type of dudes. Debo Samuel wouldn't have been a thing in 2005. But now you go, hey, I don't need Debo Samuel to run post corners. I just need you to get the ball to run over people. So from Arkansas, there's this wide receiver, Traylon Burks, mm. who's who's going to be one of those bigger slot dudes that's going to evolve how we look at slot guys or whatever. Like you don't have to be like a five seven Julian Edelman type dude, quick feet. You know, Hunter Renfro guys, he's going to be a big-ass slot dude that's not going to have a long route tree, but he's going to catch the ball and he's going to be hard to tackle. Um, what's interesting about Jamison Williams is, is that he got hurt. So if you're a team that can do the whole, I'm Tennessee, and, oh, there's this D tackle that's better than everybody else. He tore his ACL and he's the best, but I got him at 26. You know what I mean? And he turns out to be one of the better D tackles in the league. He got his name, pardon me. But you can do that with Jameson Williams. Like, Jameson Williams is going to be one of the better wide receivers in this in this um, draft or whatever. And because of his ACL injury, he could be a guy that can go late first or early second. I think he's a guy from my Cowboys sitting there at 24. So we're just going to have to see. Um, Mechie, the other wide receiver from Alabama, they're not talking about him as much, but I kind of like him as a guy that can that can get busy, just kind of, you know, has his job. He can be, you know, play inside, play outside, make these catches, smart football player. Like, you can find guys to do jobs for you. Um, you know, it's Plenty of guys, man. And the more the draft process goes, the more I'm going to you know, make these phone calls, the more guys are going to have for you. I'm not the guy that got 300 names written down right now in February. My team was winning, you know what I mean? So I'm a little behind on my draft analysis. But just a handful of names for you before, you know, April or something, you know? Vach, uh, and, I, and I think quarterbacks are, are you know, take a time to take a look at and all that too but uh, sure. you know, it's funny I didn't really love last year's class and uh, they came in with so much hype and yeah, we'll see. Time will tell, but that was pretty bad, kind of across the board, other than, than Wack Jones uh, having a decent year. Mm-hmm. And I got to look at this group. I like Pickett. I think he's just barely big enough. There's a lot of these smaller quarterbacks, though, that I don't think worked out all that well in the NFL as you look around the league. I mean, I, I still think, you know, it, it's hard to be good at six foot or six one in this league. So when you look at Kenny Pickett, you look at Coral, uh, any of these guys, you know, Malik, uh, you know, obviously, any of these guys that might go, I, I don't you know, Ritter, I, I don't really get, but any of that group of four or five guys, what's your initial impression on them? And do you think they're being a little, do you think there's anyone in this draft that's being a little undersold uh, compared to maybe three or four guys last year that were wildly oversold? No, nah, I mean, all these dudes wax. But, um, <laughs> but, what, but what, like, the, the big problem here, though, right, is, it's not a mistake that the dudes that are drafted later always end up doing the best, you know? Like, Trevor Lawrence can be Trevor Lawrence, but Jacksonville is still Jacksonville, my guy. So, you know, I'm always of the mindset of build your house first. You don't want to take a quarterback, put him in this terrible workplace, and then he ends up being terrible for you. You want him to have an offensive line that, that, you know, that's reputable, you know, have somebody to throw to a safety valve at tight end or whatever. But teams don't do that. Teams want to make that commitment. So Kenny Pickett, you know what I mean? Kenny's cool, man. Kenny's a guy that I, you know, sometimes you see good things from him. Sometimes you see bad things. He's, like, he's a very sometimes guy. And if you watch Pittsburgh play offense, there's a lot of easy throws, a lot of check down throws. But what I like about, or just something to think about with um, um, Pickett is big boy throws, right? These big throws outside the numbers, these top-level NFL throws. If he throws 10 of them, five of them are going to be fantastic. But the other five are going to hit Pam Oliver on the sideline. You know what I mean? So, like, that's a big problem with with him. He's kind of like Tua, but he's not as good as Tua, right? You know, he's just very solid, very somewhat cool, good release, but he's not going to blow you away in any kind of way, right? Well, I think two guys that are really going to be really good in this process, and not because that they're just that much better, but I think because they have the legs. And when you come into the league, at least for your first year, if you can run around and, and just make simple throws, we can find a way to win ball games with you. I've seen Jalen Hurts win ball games. Yep. He's not good to me. You know what I mean? Josh Allen has become good, and I hate Bills fans thinking that Josh Allen stuck with some kind of narrative. It was not a narrative. Josh was bad. He just got better. But but they won they won games with that dude. I think Malik Willis 
from Liberty. I think he has that kind of thing to come into the league early if the situation around him is good. He can win ball games for you. He's kind of like Cam Newton, but not as good. Um, and I think one of the big conversations around him is, oh, well, Vach, he plays at Liberty, so he plays against talent that's not good. And my retort is he plays at Liberty. He plays with talent that's not good also. So it kind of evens out a little bit. Um, big arm, probably got the biggest arm out of all these guys. And probably going to have one of the best arms when he gets into the league. His big problem is diagnosing, which is going to be weird for him. If you're a coach on the sideline, be like, look, Malik, the slant is going to be open. All you got to do is throw the slant. It's going to be right there. The slant will be open, and Malik will see it. But he's going to miss it and not throw it, and he's going to see it do 60 yards down the field and hit him perfectly in strike for a touchdown. That's Malik Willis. Uh, my other guy, Matt Corral, um, he's kind of like a Tannehill type character, right? He's, he's one of those dudes where he's really good, but you can't explain why he's really good. He's just one of those, I'm a football player and I do this kind of guy. Like he's, he, he, he doesn't have the best arm, but he throws it pretty well. He reads coverage pretty good, but he's not one of those super surgical dudes. He runs the ball really well, but he's not a Lamar Jackson kind of guy. And how I'm explaining him to you is you'll think he's a middle of the pack kind of guy. I think he's like the second best quarterback on the board. You know what I mean? It's just that that's just where we are with this draft class. There's no stunning, clear number one guy. But that's good for me because my team doesn't need a quarterback. So that means other teams get to make mistakes on these guys and all the good players fall down the board for my team to get. So uh, give me Tyler Linderbaum center from Iowa for the for the uh, Dallas Cowboys. He can be my Pro Bowl center in the near future. Vox, what do you make of the cornerbacks in this draft? I know you said you haven't, you know, really done a deep dive yet, but just you know, some first round guys that have been, you know, rated to go high, whether it's Stingley, Sauce Gardner out of Cincinnati, or even Booth at Clemson, or even McCreary or Trent McDuffie, or Roger McCreary at Auburn, or Trent McDuffie at Washington. Just seems like Sauce Gardner gained a lot of momentum this season with his play at Cincinnati and how good they were. And obviously, we've known about Stingley at LSU. He's, you know, projected to go as high as three in some cases. What I've seen, just what have you seen from them, and kind of what are, what are your thoughts on them? We've been watching Derek Stingley for so long. We've just been waiting on him to come out, waiting on him to come out. But it's like when he finally comes out, it seems like now teams are making excuses for him. Like they're making these, you know, they're manufacturing these impediments, you know, to to not draft him, right? And I'm like, man, ever since we saw this dude in his freshman campaign, all he's done is just line up and lock people up. Fantastic man cover guy, fantastic zone cover guy. And yeah, he's had a you know a weird last couple of years, but hey, if you go from a champion to a bad LSU team, I mean, how you expect me to play? Of course I may lose a little answers. Of course I may X, Y, Z, whatever. So um, I think if you put him back in the mindset of let's compete, let's be good again, I think Stingley's going to come back and be that kind of guy for you. But the league evolves, right? The league keeps moving. So once upon a time, if you think that you can find one of these Dow Reeves type of shutdown corners, those dudes could go first overall to you, right? But the league is in this thing now to where, hey, we feel like we can find corners that fit our system, you know, like in the fourth and fifth round. Like if I'm a cover three defense team or whatever, I'm just going to get the best cover three dude. And that may be somebody in the third round or whatever. So I may not draft the Derrick thing. He may fall into the, you know, tens or something like that. Um, Sauce Gardner, Ahmad Gardner, but he gets the nickname of the gear Sauce. Um, I think he's a guy that that's just kind of been low key, low key, low key until, you know, he just runs into a little bit of adversity. So, okay, cool. Can Sauce Gardner be good here? Then he's good there. And then we get Cincinnati versus Alabama. Okay, cool. Can Sauce Gardner be good versus Alabama? And he's good versus Alabama. Alabama. I don't think he's going to get drafted as high as Sting would be because we've been hearing about Sting for years and it's our first time hearing from Sauce. Even though it may have like Sauce should bump you up the damn rankings, man. <laughs> but um, I just think I think Sauce is as good as Sting. Like not you know not neck and neck. You know, Sauce could be better. Sting could be better. But like if you look at the um, at the teams that have two picks, right? Like if you're the Giants, you're the Jets, whatever. You could go Stingley early. Right. But if you think that you got a similar guy in sauce, Gardner, that you know will be there later, hey man, let me just take this pick that I would that I would take corner. Let's get this offensive line pick and then later on in that top ten or whatever, I can get a guy like Sauce Gardner that'll be just as good as things. You see what I mean? Vod, sadly, uh we're out of time, but we'll be doing this. Can you can you do this weekly with us for a while? I don't know, man. We're going to, um, you know, set some, set some contracts around. We're going to talk to your people. 
If your radio station really wants some good content, man, they're going to have to drop a bag on me or something, but you got my number, and we will discuss. You know what I'm saying? All right, Thanks for having me, man. D-O-C-H-L-O-N-B, A-R-D-I, Vox Lombardi, everything. Salute. See you, buddy. That's Vox Lombardi, everyone. You can find him on YouTube. Uh, does a great job breaking down film on these draft prospects every year. The good kid uh, who's worked hard at this and made a name for himself uh, through all this. When I first started getting him, having him on, he had about 90 followers. I really? Think he's got, Let's see what he's got now. And he's got well I think he's got well over 10,000 or I something. I think more than that, yeah. yeah so He has 13,000. Yeah. yeah. So Fouch has really done well for himself he has. and created uh, something, you know, basically out of nothing. So good for him. All right. Uh, we will we'll take a break and we'll close up the hour of sex next with your phone calls. Stick around.